Hi. We continue in Genesis 27 as Jacob takes the food that his mother Rebekah has made from the goat kids and bringing it to his father. Before we get into the details of the story, I want to just go over a couple of quick things that I've been doing since we did the introductory video to this entire section. Uh, and throughout the Jacob cycle, we've been looking at this chiasm, and today we're continuing in this section here around deception and uh, the fear of Esau, and then the other side of it down here in chapter 33. And we've also been looking at the shape of the story in terms of its beginning and end around Jacob and Esau, and its middle with Jacob and Laban. And as, uh, and as I've been suggesting since the introductory video, uh, it's my view that the point of what we're seeing in chapter 27 is Rebecca and Isaac's plan to prepare Jacob to meet the trickster Laban, who Rebecca knows very well as her brother, uh, is not going to let him in or out of Mesopotamia easily. And that's, of course, an expression of the exilic audience's struggle over the question of both leaving Babylon and also what it means to be under the Persian rule, uh, as described in Ezra Nehemiah. So I've gone over some of those things in the introductory video and we'll do more of that as we go. But for now, I just want to focus on the immediate scene here. And as we've been looking at the key words, we're going to be in this section today, this pink section, Isaac and Jacob. And as I've been noting, the whole section, including the beginning and end around Esau gaining women, forms a nice chiasm of the dialogue partners. And as I'm taking this from Smith's chiasm, as you can see up here, modified from other people's chiasms, he lays out the blessing in the center here with 26 and 29. And it doesn't have to be that way. This can go 18 to 27 here, and, because the blessing doesn't technically start until right here. But it's in the middle of uh, Isaac's speech, and so that's why he's put it there, not to have this part be up here with the continuing testing and suddenly in the middle of um, a speech to call it the blessing. So I put that there, and we'll go through verse 25 today. Uh, as I've been noting, there are a number of questionable assumptions that a number of scholars make that prevent us from hearing the story uh, openly and with the possibility that it's not what it appears on the surface, which of course is that Rebecca is trying to convince Jacob to trick his father Isaac. Um, and that's based on a number of things, including the idea that Isaac is weak as a father and is being manipulated, as you can see here. But as I noted in the introductory video, there are a number of elements in which Isaac can be shown as strong as a father, and I posted that little uh, defense argument of the lawyer in the on RadicalBible.net, so you can see that as well. Uh, but that's really important here, because as we look at this scene where um, Isaac's senses are tested, all of his senses, implicitly even his blind sight, uh, as we heard last time when he he, when Jacob protested to his mother, perhaps my father will feel me, and his eyes also seem to be mocking him. So that's what includes sight, and then we can see hearing, touch, taste, and smell. And one of the factors that makes me and many others, including David Zucker and Adrian Bloodstein, whose work, a uh, quote down here on the left, is from Zucker, and we'll see more from Bloodstein as we go, um, is that it doesn't really make any sense that uh, Isaac doesn't can't know the difference between the, the goat hair on his son's arms and Esau's hairy arms, that he doesn't recognize the difference between goat stew and wild animal stew, and he plainly recognizes the voice as the voice of Jacob uh, and lets that be. So I'd like to suggest we can listen to this either as Isaac is old and diminished and um, he's easily swayed by Jacob, even though there's so much obvious evidence uh, that it, he's not Esau, or he's in on it and he's playing along with this uh, so that Jacob doesn't recognize that his father's in on the deal with his mother. So those are the two views uh, among others, but the two primary uh, forks in the road as to how to understand this story. And a couple of things that'll help us pay attention to this. Uh, we looked previously at the comparison between Isaac's commands to Esau in 27, 1 to 4, and Rebekah's commands to Jacob in 27, 5 to 10. And we noted in the purple part that's added here, she added before Yahweh's face, before I face death. It's not translated that way in the new RSV, but I wanted to highlight that to bring up not only the literal meaning, but the face theme that will echo into the other side of the chiasm in chapter 32, where Jacob refers to uh, his face and Esau's face four times in one verse. But what's key here is not the face element, but the Yahweh element, because we see that here in verse 20, where uh, Jacob answers in terms of Yahweh based on what his mother told him, but not what, what she actually heard uh, Isaac and, and Esau speak about. And so we'll see when we get there, that uh, can be understood as the code to Isaac that Jacob is going along with the mother's plan. So that's one way to look at it. And as we look at 
um, the comparison looking forward between what we see in our scene today between Rebecca giving Jacob the food and Jacob going in and saying directly lying to his father I am Esau your firstborn and we'll see in a couple of videos later um, how when Esau finally comes in he offers a very similar statement here uh, to what Jacob had said and so not only is there a comparison of what the parents said to their two sons there's a comparison of what the two sons said to their father so we'll put the key words up here and we'll jump right into our story starting here in verse 18. Um, so, um, uh, as my note below has, repeating what I just showed you. So he went into his father, and as Aviva Gottlieb Zornberg notes, Rebecca leaves him at his father's door. He must cross the threshold of deception by himself. Uh, I noted last time when I showed a picture of a traditional uh, archaeological understanding of an Israelite four-room house. But I want to highlight as we begin this video that we really don't know what the context is. We were told they were in a house, and we have been told earlier in chapter 26 they pitched their tent near Beersheba. Um, so if it's a house, as the text says it is here, that four-room house you can look at from the last video, or um, you can just if you just use your favorite search engine, you can find an Israelite four-room uh, house on the internet to see what that looks like. But that doesn't exactly tell us the situation, which in art, as you can see in this image, um, Isaac is almost always pictured lying in bed uh, as if he's either dying or sick. But there's nothing in the text to say so. It doesn't say he's in bed, and as I've noted a couple of videos ago, he has many decades left of life. So this is not a deathbed scene and we have no reason to think that Isaac is feeble. All we know is that his eyes aren't working and that's the only fact we have that suggests that there's anything diminished about Isaac. And the language of the scene as we'll see here suggests otherwise that, that he's in bed. The in bed is just based on artists um, interpretation of the dominant reading even several hundred years ago for Renaissance art that the stories read straightforwardly as um, a trick on Isaac by Rebecca and Jacob. So with that in mind, let's let's look more closely. So he went into his father, and the phrase here, my father, and he said, um, here I am, who are you, my son? I note below the almost verbatim parallel with 22.7, which we looked at earlier, which is in the, the Akita story, where as they're walking, Isaac asks Abraham, uh, where is the wood for the fire and the sacrifice? And so that's the conversation that's being recalled, my father, here I am. But Unlike in the situation in 22, where Isaac asks about the wood for the sacrifice, uh, here, Isaac, same Isaac, asks the person before him, Who are you, my son? And so already, just from the one word, my father, um, he can hear that it's not the voice of Esau. Um, and as my note below highlights that, from Turner, just one syllable of Hebrew from Jacob is enough to make Isaac suspicious. And as Sarna notes uh, similarly, in obvious trepidation, Jacob can only utter a single word. The contrast with Esau's bold and ample statement in verse 31 is blatant. So it's just that, that one word, Ab, that leads, uh, Jake, or leads Isaac to be suspicious, if he's suspicious, if he doesn't know all along that this was the plan that he and Rebecca had put on Jacob. So, who are you, my son? He knows it's one of his sons, and my note below simply has the, ta the senses element that I have here. Maybe I'll just leave that up and we can see that. So, he acknowledges my son, um, but not clear which. Um, the reference to 1 Samuel 24 below is to Saul calling David my son when David catches him in the cave. Um, and that's part of the overall picture that our story here is parallel in many ways to the David and Solomon story. I showed that also in the introductory video, and we'll look at that more as we go. So Jacob said to his father, as blatantly as he possibly could, I am Esau, your firstborn. A couple of things we need to look at. He uses the formal I am, Anoki, here, Esau. Um, that's not often always used. It's sort of like in Spanish saying yo soy rather than just soy. Um, it's the formal way. As Zornberg says, to the extent that Jacob has the birthright, he has become Esau. Uh, that's assuming that the birthright shapes identity, and the birthright is meaningful. But as I've been trying to suggest in the last couple of um, videos, uh, Isaac and Rebecca never mention the birthright, and it's never mentioned again by the narrator or by the brothers. So I'd like to suggest the birthright is completely irrelevant. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the story, except to show that Esau had no interest in it. Um, as a note below has from the Midrash, which is very keen on defending Jacob, who is after all Mr. Israel, uh, it is I, thy firstborn son is e it is I, thy firstborn son is Esau, is how they hear it, protecting Jacob from the charge of lying. So he's trying to slip in two things, the smooth man that he is. And this is the first time we hear Bakora. 
um, in this form, Vicareka here, uh, we'd heard earlier when it was when the parents or the narrator were describing the two boys as the great son or the small son. Uh, and that same thing is characterizing Lot's daughters, who we'll see have an interesting echo in this scene a little bit later. Uh, but this is the first time we're hearing it, and we'll hear it uh, further on, but we've not heard it before. Um, these other references to firstborn uh, earlier in Genesis are a different word. So this is the first time we're hearing Bakora here. So I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me, which of course is a lie at two levels. He didn't tell him and he hasn't done anything his father said. So three lies in this first part of it. Um, and this isn't a lie, but this is a misleading thing from the, um, the translators here. So now, omitting na, please, but let's look at the full phrase here. Kum na vechala, which is stand up, please, and sit down. Um, the sit up is again reinforcing the false image that this is a deathbed scene, that somehow Isaac is lying in bed and needs to be encouraged to sit up to eat. But literally, it's stand up, please, and sit down, which is suggesting he's in one place and he's urging him to sit down at the table um, to eat, um, and which would be the normal thing, although I could not find any art images that portray Isaac eating this meal sitting at a table. So eat of my game, that's the fourth lie, um, because what he has is not game, of course, it's goat stew, so that you may bless me. And the so that ba'avar is all the way through here, four times connected with this exact phrase. Uh, we saw it here in verse um, four up here, so you may bless me. We see it in verse 10 down here, here it is 19, and it's in 31 in the parallel we see here. Um, so all four times you use that same thing, so that highlighting that the whole point of the meal is to obtain the blessing. Um, but Isaac said to his son, not being clear which one it is, how is it that you found it so quickly, my son? And interestingly, this is a challenge that neither Rebecca nor Jacob anticipated. So he's got to do this one on his feet. And that's perhaps part of the training. Perhaps Rebecca and Isaac decided, let's ask him something he's not prepared for, because certainly Laban will um, challenge him with questions that he's not prepared for, and he'll have to think on his feet and see how he does. And after all, it's not like Jacob has had a lot of time to prepare for this altogether. Um, it's only the time while Esau's out in the hunt, and the time it took Rebecca to tell him, which is only a few seconds, uh, to go get the two kids, which couldn't take long, to kill them and prepare them. I don't know how long that takes, but a couple of hours, maybe, and to make bread while they're, they're cooking. So maybe he's at a couple of hours, but that's not very long to prepare to face your father as a blatant liar and, and pretend you're um, your own brother. Um, so he's got to really think fast here for something he's not been prepared for. So how is it that you have found it so quickly? Uh, and the phrase for found it so quickly, mehereta limpso here, uh, the hurry echoes the hurry of Abraham and Sarah back in chapter 18 with the, with the guests, the divine guests, and also in 1922 around Lot um, there. And we also heard it in 24 on Abraham's servant uh, trying to get Rebecca. So all of these echoes here deal with the, the very kind of situation of hospitality uh, around the question, if not of blessing, um, of fertility and what blessing really is to have children or to have a spouse that could provide you children, which is the essence of a blessing in the biblical sense, uh, fertility. So he asks, how have you found it so quickly, my son? Notice uh, the narrator said his son, but now Isaac's saying my son for the second time here, once in 18 and once in 20, without a name. Um, he answered, because the Lord your gra God granted me success. And uh, let's look at a couple of views from this. Um, from this one down below, we hear Jacob's answer in verse 20 is beautifully, beautifully encapsulates the dual causation that drives this narrative. On the one hand, he is lying to his father. On the other, he is expressing, perhaps unwittingly, the fact that it is God's preference, not his father's, that has arranged his unlikely success. But again, that's making the assumption that the oracle is expressing divine um, uh, preference, as we saw here, that, would, that it would convey Yahweh's will. But we know nothing about that. The oracle did not say it was God's preference. The oracle simply said, this is what's going to happen. So that's one of those assumptions that scholars make that skew the text in ways um, that I'm trying to help us not to, not to do. So he said, because Yahweh, your God, granted me success. And here's a comment that I think makes more sense. At least it's consistent with my viewpoint, but also consistent with not um, assuming all those false assumptions. 
And this is from Zucker. He says, There is a further reason why Jacob invokes the specific name of the Lord in this response to Isaac. Jacob believes that in so doing, he is reflecting back to Isaac what his father actually said to Esau before Esau was sent out um, to, to hunt game, as we see here on the right side. Jacob's answer makes perfect sense within the context of the information he heard in verse 7 here um, that was given by his mother, Rebekah. There is, however, a major problem. The words of verse 7 are not Isaac's actual words. They're Rebekah's paraphrased, quote-unquote, report of what Isaac said to Esau in verses 1 to 4. Isaac does not mention the name of the Lord. And he goes on further to say, the addition of the term the Lord is the code word, which tells Isaac that Rebekah has been successful in her mission to hoodwink Jacob. Uh, and that's the, the view that makes the most sense to me here, that Jacob is using this so that Isaac can know the code between he and Rebekah, uh, that, that Jacob has been trained by Rebekah here and is carrying out their joint plan. Notice that it's still your God. This is not his God yet. We'll discover on the journey uh, between here and Laban's um, how Jacob feels about the God of his father and his grandfather. Um, and granted me success here, um, Hikra, and as my note has, the translation is too specific. Other translations were calling Abraham's servant at 24.12, claiming God's help. Um, Hoover suggests made it happen before me, based on the root word meaning happen, befall, or meet. Uh, and as Turner notes below, is this just one more untruth, or could Jacob be saying more than he realized? The Lord has indeed predicted preeminence for Jacob over Esau. Is Jacob taking God's name in vain or not? And again, his rhetorical question is based on the false assumption that the oracle is um, Yahweh's, um, Yahweh's preference. Um, so I just want to highlight how many scholars base their interpretations on assumptions that are not grounded in the text. So we continue here. Isaac says to Jacob here, Come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. How are you feeling if you're Jacob at this point? Um, you, you've gone in, you've said one word, and now you've said a few more words, and Isaac hasn't again raised the question, but it sure sounds like Jacob, it doesn't sound like Esau. And you would think that a dad could certainly recognize the voice of his two different 40-year-old sons who he's been listening to for 40 years. But he lets that one go for now. And so now we're going to get the feeling test. Come near, and I was highlighting on the last video how you, words like come near and go away uh, are used so commonly in the story, that I may feel you. Um, uh, and I won't go back to that note. Now, my son, another time, here in 20 and 21, to know whether you are really my son or not. Ha'ata. And as Hoover notes, uh, the H interrogative particle is omitted in verse 24. Well, we'll hear it again. I'll make that comparison when it comes up again in a moment. And so, if you're Jacob, you've got to be really sweating here, because he well knows that the goat skin is not the same as his brother's arms. Um, I don't care how hairy Esau is, a human hairy man, um, a human man's arm, hairy arm, is not going to feel like a baby goat. Um, and let's keep that in mind too. It's the skins of the kids, which I'm sure is very soft, although I'm no expert on goat skin. But I, so if I recall, kid skin gloves are something that's made from um, goat kids. So uh, that may be just as smooth as, I, as Jacob is anyway. I don't know. Um, but this is what happened. So Jacob went up to his father, Isaac. We don't know how far apart they were for him to go up to him. It's the same verb as come near here. So he's responding with obedience there. Who felt him, and what's Jacob feeling now, and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Um, and as Gottlieb Zornberg notes from the Midrash, the voices of a wise man while the hands have been skinning corpses. Again, showing the Midrash's prejudice for Jacob there. Um, and um, she, uh, the Midrash also offering other interpretations. For example, Jacob wields power only by his voice. Esau wields domination only by his hands. Um, and as one of them notes below, after this, Jacob only speaks once to say one word, I am. And so um, this is the... Um, the first and only time Isaac specifies his suspicion by naming Jacob in the story. But does he really believe the hands are the hands of Esau? As Schwartz has below, Esau's hairy hands are more than a technical means of identification, but rather a literary device that serves to define Esau's character as a skilled hunter. And again, that's one of those questionable assumptions that we've looked at, that being hairy makes you a hunter. And that's obviously nonsense. Um, there's nothing that says that if a, a man has hair on his body, that would make him a skilled hunter or that all skilled hunters are hairy. That's just a stereotype that has no basis 
basis in facts or history, and yet it's one that the scholars seem to keep making. Um, so, going down to a couple more verses to finish our passage for today. So, um, as we need to look at this before I look at my note here. He did not recognize him, the new RSV has, because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands, so we blessed him. And this leads many scholars to do different things. To highlight that, obviously, Isaac's not in on this, because otherwise, why would he say he didn't recognize him? But there's an issue of what this word means here. Nakar in the Hifel, which is first here in, in Genesis. Um, and as the brown driver Briggs Lexicon notes, it can imply willing to recognize or acknowledge with honor in the this form, leaving room for the possibility that Isaac knows it is Jacob, but refuses to say so directly. Um, and as Hoover notes, the option is acknowledge. And notice this is the narrator. This isn't Isaac speaking directly. So the narrator, who is the omniscient voice here, is saying, telling us something that isn't being told to Jacob in the text, um, that he refuses to acknowledge him. Um, and that's what's at issue here. Refuses to say, I know it's Jacob. Um, Plainly, it can't be because he actually is deceived by the hairy hands. Yes, they're hairy like his brother Esau's hands, um, but plainly, he would know the difference. Uh, another option is to see this verse as inserted from a different source um, to highlight something else, but we don't have to go that way. And that's the point that um, Rosa Noer, citing David Aaron, says for the notion that verse is inserted. Um, but we don't have to do that, although that's one quote-unquote solution. So he blessed him, and yet he doesn't bless him here. Um, that's anticipated, but it won't happen for a couple more verses, and he's got more testing to go. So we'll look at just another couple of verses before we, we stop for today through verse 25. So he said, are you really my son, Esau? And, and this is where the um, extra difference is uh, compared to up here. Um, as, as Hoover was noting. And so this is really asking the question, are you my son? And all he says is, or his son Esau, and he says, I am. So for the second time, he's lied directly about that. And so then Isaac says, then he said, bring it to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. Um, notice he doesn't say yours. He's um, saying um, he's not sure whose it is yet, and the taste test will have to be the question. And so he brought it to him, and he ate, and we hear nothing about that, and he brought him wine, which wasn't what Rebecca gave him. We are told that Rebecca gave him the savory food, the goat stew, and bread, and there's no mention of bread. But the mention of wine, which we don't know where it came from, is an interesting note. We've seen wine two other times in Genesis, once in 1932 to 35, where lots um, two daughters, the greater and the younger, um, the greater and the smaller rather, uh, get him drunk two nights in a row to try to have children with him. And back in nine where Noah gets drunk and his children try to cover him up after Ham uh, saw his father naked. So notice all three wine stories in Genesis are fathers and multiple children around that. So we're supposed to be looking back here at the story of Lot and his daughters and Ham and his sons in consideration here of Isaac and Jacob and Esau. So we'll stop there for now, and um, next time we'll look at his father continuing to respond to these tests of whose testing you can still decide and giving his son um, Jacob the blessing of the firstborn. See you for that next time. Bye-bye.